When I left Meta, one of the things I knew I'd missed the most is this. It's called StyleX, and it's the system that Meta's been using internally for CSS for a very long time. Essentially, it just allows you to write CSS in JavaScript, but in sort of a modular way. So of course, when they open sourced it, I decided to use it. I've been using it for a few months now, and it's honestly incredible when it works. And that's the problem. I've heard a lot of people talking about it as sort of this tailwind killer, and I don't know if it'll ever be that, but I do think it's really cool. So I want to talk about it and also sort of focus a little bit on some of the negatives and the things that I hope they iron out over the next few releases to make this much easier to actually use. So first I want to talk about how exactly this works, and then we'll get into some of the shortcomings I found with it as I've been using it over the last few months. So here's the example from their documentation. Use this stylex.create function. It takes in an object, and each of the keys in this object are sort of like CSS classes. I think they call them namespaces here, but you can think of them as CSS classes. And then the values of these keys are going to be these objects. And inside of those objects, you have the actual declarations. And for the most part, I think this is pretty straightforward. When I first started using this at Meta, I didn't even think twice about it. There was literally zero learning curve. It's basically just CSS inside of JavaScript. Although there is one very nice thing, and that's that because this is JavaScript, it's actually scoped to the individual module. So you don't have to worry about having different classes in different places that are conflicting with each other, which sounds like a very small issue. But if you have a very large team working on something and you have these massive CSS files, it's possible that you just choose the same class names multiple times and they end up conflicting with each other in some way. So you don't have to worry about that as much when you're using StyleX. Then you can see you can also do things like pseudo classes and pseudo elements. So for example, if you want to use the hover pseudo class, you have the background color, and instead of just putting the value, you make it an object, and then you can have a default, and then you can have the different pseudo classes, such as in this case, hover and active. And then pseudo elements work in a very similar way. You also have media queries. So for example, you can say you have a width and you have a default value, and then these two media queries, Although one thing I don't love about it that I prefer in normal CSS is that in CSS you can say, okay, I want all of my mobile specific styles to go over here and you sort of have one big media query. Whereas with this, you have to do this media query or the media sort of selector every single time. So you have one for width and then you'd have one maybe for height and maybe one for margin and you just do this over and over again. Whereas I think it makes more sense to have it all grouped by the screen size rather than grouped by the property value. And then of course, to actually use the styles, the way they recommend to do it is to spread the stylex.props function and you pass in that namespace as they called it. You can also merge styles so you can use multiple at the same time just by making a comma separated list. So for example, this uses the base and highlighted. So those are those two namespaces right here or essentially the CSS classes. All right now, so if you click on the playground section of their website, this is one thing I find a little bit disappointing. That's that it says a full playground is coming soon and this has been like this for a while. So I don't know if it's actually coming soon, but one thing I would love to see is a very basic playground where I can see the code I type in and then see the code it actually outputs. So I want to be able to see the stylex code I write and then see the CSS that it actually generates. And then even better is I'd love to be able to go the opposite direction as well. I think that'd be a great learning tool if I could write CSS and then it would automatically translate it into stylex code so that I can understand how to actually sort of convert my thinking from CSS thinking to stylex thinking. And I know not everything will translate perfectly, so maybe it's not going to handle absolutely everything, but I do think this would be a very cool learning tool if they were able to build it. But anyways, here's the example they actually give. So this is a Next.js application. So this does work with Next.js, although again, more on that in a minute because I've had a lot of trouble actually using it with Next.js. But anyways, we can see we have a standard component and for example, we have this h1 and it has the stylex props of s.h1. So if we go here, we can see we have stylex.create. And for example, this is our h1. So if we change something here, we'll see it actually change over here. So the h1 is this. So if, for example, I added color and then let's just make it blue so it's super obvious, then we will see this now becomes blue text. And you can also see in this example how to use media queries. So for example, they have this flex direction that is row and then on mobile, it changes to column. So we can see if we make this bigger, it becomes a row and then at this point it becomes a column. So it's pretty cool as well. And they actually have this constant for this. So media mobile, 
if we come up here, is actually just this constant here. I also wanted to mention some of the limitations of StyleX that they actually sort of mentioned themselves, which I appreciate them putting them in the documentation. But some of these I just don't fully agree with, and I think it's going too far away from what we're used to with traditional CSS. And one of those is this encapsulation section, which essentially is saying you can't do things like this. So these are combinators in CSS. So for example, this first one gets any element with the class of class name, and it gets all the elements that are directly nested inside of it. And for example, this one gets elements with the class of class name that are being hovered over, and then it gets the elements directly inside of it that are divs and the first child. And they call them styles at a distance. Really what this is is combinators. And when you sort of think in StyleX, which is literally the name of this page of the documentation, it makes sense that these aren't allowed because it doesn't fully make sense with the model. But in a way, I think that's how the model breaks down a little bit because these are actually useful things. And achieving the equivalent of these things in StyleX is very difficult because you cannot do this. So instead you end up doing it essentially through the JavaScript portion, even though this is still JavaScript, but you do it in the more JavaScript-y way rather than doing it in the more CSS way. And it feels like these are things that are meant to be done in a more CSS way, if that makes sense. Like for example, if I wanted to do this first thing where we get all of the elements that are direct children of elements with the class of class name, I'd have to do this in a very JS centric way of finding wherever we, we would be using this class name and instead adding some style X to literally every single direct child. And I don't know, maybe that's better. Maybe some people like that. I actually thought it was a good idea at first. It seemed good, but as I've been using this more and more, I've actually found that it's just sort of limiting and it makes it harder to write some code than it feels like it should be. All right, now I wanna talk about what is honestly one of the most frustrating developer experiences I think I've ever had. And that is simply installing StyleX. It feels like it should be very simple, but frankly, it wasn't. Now, granted, we usually only set things up like one time. It doesn't matter that much, but it's just extremely frustrating. And I think it mostly comes down to this documentation just being confusing. So let's walk through this documentation from the perspective of somebody trying to set up a brand new Next.js application. And I'll try to show you where I think it's just very confusing. So first it says you need to install StyleX. Simple enough. I did that, it worked. So the first major section is about the compiler and it says the recommended way to use StyleX in development and production is with the build time compiler. I wish here it would mention to you what the alternatives are. It doesn't say it until way later in the documentation. And when I got to that later point, I didn't even realize I was looking at the alternatives to the compiler and I ended up trying to do things I didn't need to be doing because I was using the compiler. So this in itself, I actually found to be a tad confusing, but not too big of a deal. It doesn't tell you to do anything here yet, so we can sort of move on. And it says that for development, you need only to configure the Babel plugin so that styles are processed at compile time. The plugin will compile styles and insert runtime style injection code into your JavaScript modules. And it tells you to install this thing, and then it gives you a Babel config file. Not only did I realize that this was unnecessary, this actually caused it to not work. I am by no means an expert in Babel or any of these types of things. All I know is that doing this literally caused it to not work. So you need to just know to skip this section. And I don't know how I'm supposed to know that. Like maybe it's because I'm using Next.js so I don't need to do this thing and there's sort of a Next.js section a little bit later. But at no point does it say, hey, if you're using Next.js, don't do this. Or maybe you are supposed to do this and for some reason I just never needed to. And when I did try to do this, I just got a bunch of error messages. And when I got rid of it, things worked. So I don't know, but I found this whole section very confusing. I was able to get this to work without doing this, but literally the only way I could get it to work was when I realized, hey, what happens if I just delete that Babel config they gave me? Next, it talks about production. And this one does have a Next.js specific section, which was nice. So you install this and then there's a Babel RC file and you can simply copy it. And then you can copy this into your next.config.js file. And this worked perfectly. This did exactly what it said it was going to do and it allowed it to actually work. Although this is frustrating for a couple reasons. So one, this automatically disables SWC, which is essentially the more modern version of the next compiler. They claim it's 17 times faster than Babel. So I would prefer to be using that, but I guess if we want to use StyleX, we no longer can use this because we are using this custom Babel config. And you can try to use this experimental flag to force SWC transforms, 
Although I found that this doesn't actually work and you end up with a bunch of issues. So I wasn't able to get that to work, although maybe there's a way to do it. And also, this means that you no longer can use next slash font. So whenever you have a custom Babel config, you are no longer able to use next font. And is this an absolute deal killer? No, of course not, but it's a nice way to import fonts. I would prefer to be able to use it, and it seems a little bit ridiculous to not be able to use it, but you can't. So that's just sort of a thing to know, a thing to be frustrated with, and a thing that's not in the StyleX docs, and something you need to know because when you create a base application in Next.js, it's going to be using an import to next slash font. And because of that import, it's not going to work until you go and delete that code. So I wish that was in the documentation for StyleX, like, hey, if you're going to use this with Next, you need to go delete these things from your repository. Next, coming back to the documentation, there's this section on local development only, which I suppose is the alternative to using the compiler, but I found this section to be a little bit confusing too. You don't actually need to do this. I don't know when you need to do this, but at first glance, when I was just trying to go through this, I was like, oh, I'd like to be able to do local development, so maybe I need to do this. When in reality, I did not. This was sort of an alternative to that compiler option, but it was just sort of unclear to me in reading this documentation that that's what that meant to be. Maybe that's a me issue, maybe it's user error, but I would imagine if I'm being confused by this, other people probably are too. And then finally, the end of the installation instructions tells you how to use ESLint. It tells you to add these things to the eslintrc.js file for your ESLint config. And this, for the most part, worked. Although with Next.js, by default, the ESLint config is going to be a .json file rather than .js. So you have to convert this into JSON or convert the one you already have in Next.js from JSON to .js. I wish that was more obvious again, but it's just something you need to sort of notice and then change yourself. But either way, not too big of a deal. The ESLint plugin does seem to work pretty well. And another step I found to be essentially necessary that's not in that documentation is for your scripts and your package.json. So if you're using Next.js, there's going to be this .next directory. And that .next directory is going to contain some caching information, and that caching information is going to make StyleX behave very strangely when you are doing your development. So because of that, what I found is if you add a pre-dev and pre-build script, both of which are just going to delete that directory, then you don't have that issue with the caching because you're just completely creating a new .next directory every time. And really nothing I've said is to say that StyleX is bad. I love StyleX. I wish everybody would use it. I wish we could use it absolutely everywhere. However, right now I find that it is extremely frustrating to use. There's not answers to most questions online simply because not that many people are using it, so not that many people are asking questions about it. And a lot of these things I found, I basically had to just do trial and error to see which thing is going to work because it's not super well documented. And then there's other things. I can't tell if it's a bug or sort of user error and I just can't figure out how to do it. And there's nowhere in the documentation that tells me how to do it. I also can't find anything like a just complete list of property values that are supported or things like what actually happens when you don't use a unit. A lot of times we have something like font size 16, is that pixels? I mean, probably, but what about if you do margin 16? Is that also pixels? Does it ever make a pure number something other than pixels? I don't know, because there's nothing in the documentation that necessarily tells me what exactly that does. That said, it's still super early. I chose to use something that is very early in its open source development, so hopefully it does get better over time. So let me know if you've tried StyleX, what you think about it, if you plan to use it at any point in the future, and I'll see you in the next video.